Welcome to the Justice Journal Podcast. I'm Sacramento County District Attorney Anne Marie Schubert. I hope you enjoy this podcast series where we discuss important public safety issues and provide insight into who we are as an office and what we do both in the courtroom and in the community to provide the highest level of public safety through prosecution, prevention, and innovation. So we're back with the director of our crime lab, Chip Pollock. In our last episode, Chip gave us a little bit of his background and talked about the different areas of our crime lab and what kind of work or evidence is being analyzed. We're going to pick up this episode diving a little bit deeper into the criminalists at our lab and the type of equipment we have at the lab. So welcome back, Chip. Thank you. Tell us about our criminalists. Well, um, currently we have um, about 40 to 41 staff members at our laboratory. Um, we're, we have analysts that are criminalists that are assigned to various sections of, of our laboratory, um, as I spoke in our last episode. Um, for the most part, um, we, have, we do encourage a lot of our criminalists to get cross-trained. So we try to have flexibility within our laboratory. So uh, we have individuals that are, for example, firearms examiners, but then are also crime scene team response members. Um, Is that because they rotate or just so they can, if there's extra work in one area, they can help cover? You can help cover things, but it's also um, when you have some crime scene experience and you're working in the lab, the two can complement each other. Okay. Um, you can be at a crime scene because you know what you're going to be doing in the lab, certain strategies on how you collect something, you'll have a little better insight on because right. you're doing the work. Right. And vice versa, when you get cases in um, that are submitted, you can kind of get an idea as a crime scene and uh, a response member or investigator how to approach that case from within the laboratory. Okay. So we try to keep our, ourselves a little bit flexible um, so we can move people to different positions or not move them temporarily, take somebody to help work in a certain area of the laboratory to keep, keep processes moving along. So when they cross train, do they have somebody who sort of their mentor or they just go into a different area and, and learn what they're doing? We have a pretty extensive training program at, at our laboratory. Um, the individuals go through these training modules mm -hmm. and part of our requirement is being accredited after you complete all your training modules you have to do what they call a competency test mm -hmm. it's basically it's a mock case that you have to you have to complete that mock case you don't have any you you have to work it um, alone you don't really get any feedback about that case and it's pretty much a pass fail at that point we in addition to the to the mock trial that we, or we do a mock trial as well and that is to we use that mock case as a as the example and then we actually set up in our laboratory a prosecutor and a defense expert and a judge and we go through the complete court process of testimony and with the combination of those two things if you pass then you're able to do casework so for every individual that does work in any subdiscipline has to go through this process. Uh -huh. So it's it's it kind of it's interesting because many times the the moot courts that we have are mm -hmm. probably more vigorous than you might expect because mm -hmm. you have people that really know the science. Right. <laughs> right. But that leads me to my next question. Aside from the science work, what else do the criminalists need to do within their role? Well, we do outside training to our law enforcement agencies. We try to provide them training. Um, we will provide them crime scene workshops so they can send their crime scene investigators either out to our laboratory and we can train them or we'll actually go out to their agencies and train them. We also train, do training for our deputy district attorneys on certain aspects of forensic science. Many times we do it with many of the newer Dis deputy mm -hmm. district attorneys. Mm -hmm. We have. I know we have a class on uh, that we review our how we do controlled substance analysis. We have a DUI workshop that mm -hmm. we do. Um, and is that to better inform them of what the type of evidence you need or what to look for? I think it's the type of evidence that, that we would receive, how we do the analysis so they have a little better understanding of how the, how the actual analysis is conducted. Okay. I think that helps them so when they are going to prosecute the case, they understand a little bit of the science behind it. Mm -hmm. um, we also are required to go to court and testify. So that that is something that 
um, happens quite often. I think it, it makes some people a little bit more nervous than others. I was going to say, because I am not a scientist, I am a communications person, and I know that most people do not like public speaking, so that must be very outside of what they're used to anyway. If they've gotten into the field of science to go up on a in, on a juror stand and, and, and have to testify. It, it's interesting. I feel more comfortable on the stand than I would do when I have to give a presentation to hmm. peers of mine in a conference. So well, it's, it's interesting. Because <laughs> some, some of our cases are high profile and there are media cameras in the room too. And I imagine yeah. uh, they'd have to experience that every once in a while too. Yeah. So there's a lot more involved than just science. In, oh, yeah. In, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the equipment now. You mentioned earlier on we have a lot of state-of-the-art state equipment. Can you give us an example and how it, it's used in, in a practical sense? Well, probably the, the one piece of equipment that we're um, pretty well known for is that we have an instrument that um, we're the only laboratory in the western part of the U.S., a forensic laboratory that can do elemental analysis of glass. Um, that's been an area that we have really um, we have a very we have a very strong expertise in. We've been involved in a numerous research projects in the area of, of elemental analysis of glass. Um, but the instrument it's 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 called a um, it's called an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. Oh so the easiest thing we call it is we call it an ICPMS. And wow. basically, what that allows us to do is we can take a very small fragment of glass and we can um, basically analyze that glass. We use a, a high intensity laser to basically etch away little pieces of the glass and it goes into the ICPMS and it tells us it's an elemental profile. And it's one of the most sensitive tests anywhere in the world currently, the most discriminating test. And there's only about 12 laboratories in the nation that has this capability. So what would you do with that pro elemental profile? What happens from there? So a good example of types of cases we would use, uh, say you had an example of a hit and run case, mm -hmm. and you have glass fragments that were removed mm -hmm. from the victim, and you had oh. a suspect's vehicle and a windshield, for example. Mm -hmm. We'll then compare the, the glass from the windshield to the glass fragments that were removed from the clothing of the victim, and then we will see if they are if they're similar or not. And the, the most discriminating test that's available to us after we've gone through all the different series of tests we can do with glass analysis is the elemental composition test, which is done. Composition. Yes, the elemental composition determination based on using the ICP MS. So would that say that this, the glass fragment in the clothes is came from the windshield or is it just that's the same kind of glass? What we will say is that glass fragment from the victim um, was found to be indistinguishable from the glass of the, let's say, the suspect's front windshield. And it could, or it could be from a glass that was manufactured by the same manufacturer okay. that had the same chemical and physical compare, uh, composition. Hmm, interesting. Any other? We also mm -hmm. have um, a part of our crime scene unit is we have a um, 3D laser scanner. Mm -hmm. um, we currently have a newer newer version of it, but what the laser scanner allows us to do is to set up this, this scanner at a crime scene. It uses a, a high-speed whirling laser that actually measure um, points of, of distance at the crime scene. So anything that the laser sees in its, in its sight will measure. And then it has a camera, a digital camera, that will then go back and photograph the crime scene. And what we can do at that point is stitch the two the data point cloud and the images mm -hmm. together, and then what you basically see is what you see, the camera sees, we can now take measurements of. So our current system um, can measure about, um, it measures up in over a million, well, I think it's around two to four million points per second. So it's wow. a very, very fast um, speed type of a system. So it allows us to basically document a crime scene. So you're essentially freezing the crime scene in time so you can go back later. Yeah, and the beauty about it is you're freezing it in time, but if you were doing it traditional measurements, if you, for example, didn't have a certain measurement, if there was an important mm -hmm. measurement to make and you didn't do it at the time you were at the crime scene, mm -hmm. you can't go back and do it. Right. Now we have the laser data that we can always go back and get that measurement if we need to get it. You mentioned two very high-powered 
uh, pieces of equipment. Are there any closed cases you can talk about that one or both of these were, were used? Well, um, I, yeah, um, our first, actually the very first case we used our, our ICPMS on was a case out of uh, Galt. Mm -hmm. It was a 2003 homicide case. It was a double homicide. Um, the sus, sus, uh, subject's name was Darren Gunder. And what we had actually had found was um, the suspect was apprehended and inside the, his vehicle on the floorboard of his car, he had a wooden bat. Mm -hmm. And um, we examined that bat and found fragments of glass embedded into the wood part of the, of the bat. Well, the was he a suspect in a crime at that point? Yes, okay. he was. He was arrested for a suspicion of a double homicide. Okay. Um, the the victims, I believe, the the backsliding door of the victim's home was was broken, and mm -hmm. that's how they gained entry into the home. Okay. Um, so we removed these small fragments of glass from the bat, and we compared them back to the sliding glass window. And we found that again that the two that the glass from the bat was found to be indistinguishable from that of the window. The interesting thing about that case, which made it um, made the power of that ICPMS so so incredible, was that was a double paned sliding glass window. So if you know in your home you have mm -hmm. a double pane, right. we could actually tell the difference between the inside and the outside pane of glass on that on that sliding glass window. When you talk about it's found indistinguishable. Is that pretty much that glass came from that window, or is it we, we, similar to? We you? haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. The research is moving; they're trying to move to that way. It's a little bit difficult and trace evidence to to provide a probability or a statistical value to the evidence. Okay. Glass, for example, it's used in so many different areas, mm -hmm. um, vehicles, uh, architectural um, bottles that it's so widely, vastly used across and all over the world, you can't set up a statistical model to calculate out that. Really, the only time we can say that a piece of glass came from another piece of glass in an exclusion of other glasses is when we can physically fit the two pieces of glass together. Okay, that would be a question. Right? That would be when we could say, it is this glass came from this object, period. Um, but there has been work and there's been studies that have been going on to try to give what they call frequencies um, of, of glass reports. And that would be entail laboratories, maybe even nationally, creating these databases of glass samples that you would then look into, your, have your piece of glass and compare it into this database to see how many other glasses in this huge database have the same exact features as mm. the glass I have. Right. And then you could report a, a frequency of whatever it might be. There's only 1% of all the glass in this huge database that has the same features. So that might give the jury a little bit better idea of the What are the odds of, of those what two are the much odds right. of it. Okay. But it also falls into not only how unique is that glass, but also you have to deal with the activity itself. How, how common would it be for you, for example, to have just glass on your clothing? Right. So it's a two-part process mm -hmm. how unique is the glass and how how common is the activity that you might have this glass on your clothes how small are we talking about these glass fragments i mean are, are they what's what would the size be that you could actually work with a piece of glass oh boy um i would say um we're talking um i would say if we had if you had a pencil a pencil eraser mm -hmm. you could probably a piece of glass that was a quarter of a size of a pencil eraser would be more than adequate for us to do the analysis. So we're wow. talking very, very small fragments mm -hmm. that, we, that we're looking at. A, a second case we did, which is um, a case that we used our laser scanning system on, was on the uh, Jessica Funk Haslam case, mm -hmm. um, the young girl that was was murdered in uh, over the in a baseball field over in Rosemont Park. Rosemont. Um, we deployed our scanner on that crime scene. We used our scanner to scan the scene. About um, a year later, we went back out to the Rosemont Park and scanned the rest of the park to be able to give the jury, the, mm -hmm. the district attorney of prosecuting the case, wanted them to have a little better the jury have a better idea of this park. Mm -hmm. So we went back out about a year later and scanned the rest of the park and then merged all those scans together. And that was the first case that I'm aware of that we actually introduced into, into trial in that particular case. Let me ask you, when you say you introduced that in, 
during the trial. What does that look like? What are the what are the jurors seeing? Well, basically, what they did the the the, the uh, prosecuting attorney in that case had me come in and and basically uh, testify to what I did mm -hmm. in, at the scene and how the scanner worked. But I also um, we generate what they call um, you can generate a final product of the scan, and it's called a true view. Mm -hmm. And this true view allows an investigator, and in this particular case, the jury, to be able to look at the actual crime scene um, in a final product. Mm -hmm. So I basically explain to the jury how to open up the true view and how to navigate through the true view. So if they wanted to look at it, they could go into the true view themselves and look at the scanner data. I'm very confident that many of the people who are listening to this, they themselves or they know somebody who's fascinated or interested in CSI, forensic science, with the popularity, especially with the, with the different true crime shows and the CSI shows, is there any guidance or advice you can give to anyone who's listening on how they can start going down that path, whether they're, you know, teens or they're already in college or something that, you know, the, something that they want to do in their second career, what would you suggest that they do? Well, I would say if you have an interest in science, um, you know, forensic science is a outstanding career. Um, like I said, I got into the career and I enjoy it because of the variety that I get to do. Now, there's certain areas of forensic science where if you don't want variety, you can do just general casework. But if you like the variety, there's a lot of different avenues to, to pursue. Um, the one thing I would suggest is that um, you know, if you're going to go into this field, you're going to need to get your degree in the, in the sciences, mm -hmm. chemistry, molecular biology, biochemistry. Um, here in the state of California, there are some additional courses that you're required to take, um, some additional chemistry courses that the state requires, and but that's somewhat unique to California. So, mm -hmm. but it's always good to have those cases, those courses under your belt, so you have the more flexibility to go where you wherever you want to go. Right. Um, it's always great if you can get an opportunity to get internship experience. Um, our laboratory through the DA's office offers internships. Um, so we do have them on occasion. Um, is that for college students? Or? For mostly is it for college students. It would be typically junior, senior college level and also graduate work. Okay. We do we do have a we do have graduate students that come in that work on their master's mm -hmm. program uh, thesis. Um, it all goes through the uh, district attorney's office, then we propose it, and then they will approve it. Um, the one benefit of that is in our in our laboratory, most of all of the master's thesis projects we've gone through, actually we're using that, what the product of that in, in our lab oh, wow. in doing casework. Um, one thing you need to be aware of is, again, you're, most of these are going into the law enforcement realm, mm -hmm. so it's something that you need to make sure, you know, you're going to be going through criminal background checks and all those things, so you need to make sure that you have a pretty clean criminal ba background. You don't want to have that be the stumbling block from you getting into to the forensics work. Is there any licensing with criminalists? Are, are you, you said that there are certain things that there they There is to... a certification, a professional certification. Um, you can, I, I have a certification in um, general criminalistics mm -hmm. through this uh, organization called the American Board of Criminalists. Mm -hmm. um, you actually take, a, take an exam and get certified and then you have to do um, on the job training yearly basis in order to maintain your certification. Okay, so it's um, almost like MCLE for other professions. Correct, yes, very similar. Okay. What would you say, if you watch, I don't know if you watch true crime shows, CSI type shows, but what would you tell people that is realistic and not realistic? So I think a lot of people look at the Hollywood version and they think that that's exactly how working in that profession really is. Well, I would say the biggest thing is that um, you never can get a case done with it between two no. between two commercials. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that is that is one thing uh, is kind of amusing to me, and like the CSI program, you'll see the criminalists in there that are also full fledged investigators, and we're not really we don't have that role. We're more of the of the of the behind the scenes type of role in the laboratory working in that aspect. Um, some of the stuff that they're doing um, is is what we do. The, real, the reality. It's just it's just accelerated in an area that it's just much not, more dramatic. Much more dramatic. Yes. yes. <laughs>
So a new program that we started out at the crime lab, and you're obviously very intricately involved, and we think it's a, it's a good insight for high school students who might not know anything about forensic science and might pique their interest is our crime lab you shadow day, and we just had our first one this past summer. What was involved in that? It was it was quite a long day. We had two sessions, I know. But can you tell us a little bit about how that was organized and what, what students were able to learn and participate and well it's, it, it, the day was it was a, it was a great day and and I'm really proud of the staff. They really embraced the whole idea of it. Um, even though it was a lot of work um, mm -hmm. for us and a lot of work for the staff, um, they really embraced it, which I was really proud of how they did it. Um, how we set up this this uh, youth shadow day is we wanted to give them a little bit of experience of what it's really like to work in a crime lab. So um, we broke up the, the kids into groups and they actually uh, visited various sections of our laboratory. Um, for example, we had a whole crime scene, um, mock crime scene set up down in our basement where the, the kids got an opportunity to evaluate blood spatter. Um, they also um, were able to do, um, using the um, crime scene lights to be able to look for fibers on a body. Um, we had the ability for, um, we went into our chemistry unit where they had an opportunity to do some of the chemical screening tests that we do on real case work. I think the kids really enjoyed our firearms unit. <laughs> um, the firearms people did a great job where they had them do distance determinations mm -hmm. and uh, look at evidence and things like that. In our last um, Youth Shadow Day, we added a trace evidence component, which we didn't do in our first one. Um, we had the kids come in and, and look at fibers under a microscope and mm -hmm. look at hair. They actually they actually looked at their own hair and took photographs of it and things like that. So um, I, I hope the kids really enjoy oh, it. They, they did. Seem, we got a, such great feedback. They yeah, seem I, to really like it. Mm -hmm. um, and the staff, you know, like I said, I, I can't I can't give enough credit to them. I mean, they did they they did it. They did the whole thing. And, and it was a great success. Is there anything else you want to add that we haven't covered? Um, no, I mean, I'm, I thank you for the time to be able to talk about our laboratory. I mean, I'm really proud of what our laboratory is and where we are and what our reputation is. And I'm really thankful for all the support that um, our current district attorney, Anne Marie Schubert, has provided to us. I mean, if we didn't have the support of downtown, we really wouldn't be where we are today. Okay, well, thanks for sharing your insight and your experience, Chip. Thank you. Join us for our next episode when we shift our focus from what the office does in the courtroom to what we do in and with the community by highlighting one example of an outside-the-box approach to resolving and preventing crime at Motel 6 properties throughout the county. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find all of the Justice Journal podcasts on our website at sacda.org, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube.